Thank you everyone for making it across the street here to the Sheraton. I know that the sessions here are not getting us as much as attendance uh, as the ones in the conference center, so I appreciate you being here. My name is Yin Arenas. I work on the Microsoft Graph team, and today we're going to talk about Microsoft Graph. I have a super, super packed session, so warning, uh, this thing is going to be fast. We probably are not going to get to all the content, but you are going to be able to download the deck afterwards. And then we have a ton of sessions in the theater and some other uh, breakout sessions through the rest of the week that are going to cover some of the content if I don't get to cover it all today. So this is what we have as the agenda for today. First, I'm going to quickly go over what is Microsoft Graph. Then I'm going to go to what's new for Build 2018. Then we're going to go, as a developer, how do you get started with the Microsoft Graph? What are the first things that you can do to get from 0 to 60? Then we're going to go to talk about different API highlights from the different services that we have in Microsoft Graph. Then we're going to, this is the section that I'm not sure if we're going to get to cover, tips and tricks on when you're interacting with the Microsoft Graph, um, what are things that you will watch out for or it's good that you know. And then next steps in terms of other sessions that we have throughout conference and things that we have in the booth for you to see. OK, so let's get started with the introduction. So I want you to think for a minute on all of the sets of data that you are producing on a daily basis. So whether there is a static data, uh, intentional data, like the documents that you have, um, that you author on a regular basis, whether it is in Word or in Excel, PowerPoint, or the information that you have around your organization. What is your organization? Who are the users in that organization? The groups in that organization? The set of uh, users that are part of it and their profile information. So this is intentional data. Then we have conversations and feeds, things that are going on in Microsoft Teams, in Outlook, all of these set of information that uh, relates us as users with other users, canvases that are used to do that, right? Like, whether what all of the conversations and group activities that are happening across Outlook and Teams and SharePoint and all of these collaboration canvases. And finally, we have ambient data. These are signals that are coming in into the graph uh, based on our activity. So if you have a fitness tracker, you know, the fitness tracker is tracking how many steps you walk for the day. Well, in the graph, we're also tracking, like, you know, who are the people that you collaborate with? Who are the people that you email with? What are the documents that you author and who are you authoring those documents with? So that we can infer those signals and then take out insights out of those um, signals that we get from the graph. So in, with this context about the con like constellations of data, we're, this is what we have in Microsoft Graph. We have data about you, about your usage of Microsoft services. So if you are a customer, whether that's on our commercial or on our consumer cloud, having a, an account with us, then you have data in the Microsoft Graph. I get the question asked, like, you know, how do, I, how do I get my data in the graph? Well, if you're a Microsoft customer, you already have your data in the Microsoft Graph. OK, so what is the Microsoft Graph? It's the gateway to your data in the Microsoft Graph, it's your, uh, in the Microsoft Cloud. If you're a developer and you're building a web application, a native or a device app, if you're building a bot, if you're building a background process, a service daemon application, you can interact with the Microsoft Graph to get access to data across Office 365, Windows, and enterprise mobility and security. What type of data do you get out of it? Do you get starting the identity of the users, whether that, identity, whether that user is on the consumer or on the commercial cloud? You get rich context for all of the things that the user is doing. You get deep insights by, by back to our, you know, the signals that we get from the activities of the users on the service and to get real-time -time updates because of the capabilities that we have in the graph around notifications. <clears throat> so takeaway, Microsoft Graph is an API to all your data across Office 365, Windows, and EMS. All the users means that if you have an Outlook.com account, at Hotmail.com, or at Live.com account, or any of the consumer accounts that we have, or if you're a co commercial co organization with at any at on microsoftonline.com or at your own domains, 
that have an account in Azure AD, a service in Office 365, there's the data for you. And then the graph gives you one way to access it. One endpoint, one auth token that you will be able to use to get all access to this information, one set of documentation, one SDK. And if you've been a developer working with our products for a long time, you maybe remember how before that you had to learn how to interact with each of the individual services that we had. Whether that was you know, getting information from Azure Active Directory was different if you wanted to get information from SharePoint, was different if you wanted to get information from a Windows service, different if you wanted to get information from Intune, right? Now what you're doing is you're accessing through a REST endpoint the data that is behind the graph across all of these different services and the key value prop here is that you learn how to interact with the service once, and that that learning, that investment that you have put in into learning about how to interact with the graph automatically translates to all of the different services. So you know how to get a profile picture from a user. Now you know how to get a thumbnail from a file in SharePoint, right? Like it's very simple to translate those skills from one service to the other. And in addition to getting data, so there's another opportunity which is, for, as a developer, you can, one, build your own experiences, like a mobile application or a web application or a service daemon application or a serverless application that is running on Azure Functions, or you can extend the experiences that we have on the Microsoft 365 canvases, whether that's documents, like using add-ins in Word, in Excel, in PowerPoint, that connect to the Microsoft Graph and bring in information into the experiences that the user is working on, whether that's uh, conversations or conversational experiences to Outlook or Microsoft Teams where you can build bots or build cards and build things that connect, participate in, the, in these first party experiences and connect to the Microsoft Graph. Pages in SharePoint, for those of you that uh, are familiar with SharePoint development, web parts and, and things in the SharePoint framework connect to the Microsoft Graph and bring information right there into the pages, uh, into, the, into the SharePoint experiences and the Windows timeline. So these are all opportunities for you, for your application to engage into the places where the users are, where the users are spending their time, get data from the graph, and then enhance those experiences. And of course, also your own, your own canvases and your own experiences through the web, the um, devices or service applications. Now, we always like to put in data and numbers out there, and we actually feel very proud about this ones. 90% 90, 90 of Fortune 500 companies are uh, using our services and hence have data in the Microsoft Graph. Over 700 million connected Windows devices, 135 million users in Office 365, just like a generous amount of times that our users log into a service in a daily basis. If we think about enterprise mobility and security, there's over 65 million organizations that are using the, our services. Over 181 countries around the world. So this is a lot of potential. If you are an, work for an ISV, just think about the amount of reach that you could have by integrating with the Microsoft 365 platform. Being able to reach millions and millions of users across many different sectors with the applications that you build and integrate with our platform. Now, the opportunity doesn't stop there. Satya talked yesterday in the keynote about Azure and Microsoft 365 of the two places that have the, the opportunity for developers when you come and integrate with Microsoft. So when you're building an integration with the graph, you can take advantage of all of the Azure capabilities, whether that's the compute, whether it's processing, all of the functionality that is in there, and we actually are uh, at Build, we're announcing that we're opening up a tunnel between Azure, the Microsoft Graph, and Azure. You can build managed, managed access to the Microsoft Graph. There is a session that we're going to give on Wednesday at 4 that goes in depth about this particular uh, thing that I just mentioned. Okay, that covered brief overview of what is Microsoft Graph. I hope that, you know, Everyone has now a great understanding of Microsoft Graph is an API endpoint, gateway to your data in the Microsoft Cloud, whether it is a consumer account or a commercial account, if you are a customer of the Microsoft 365 services, you have data in the graph, and you can access it as a developer using REST APIs with one token, one endpoint, 
and you will be able to access information across Office 365, Windows, and enterprise mobility and security systems services. Now, a graph has been there for now a couple, three years, and every year we keep adding more and more and more data. So I wanted to briefly go over what are the set of new things that we've added for Build 2018. The next um, slides are going to be quite busy, so I'm not going to go over all of the things. Just it's going to be a splash on the wall with a lot of things, and I've divided it in two things: data sets and capabilities. So we're going to start with the data sets. So data sets. Again, I divided into Office 365, Windows, and EMS. If you think about all of the different set of data and all of the different set of services that are part of these offerings, you'll see that we have a lot of new capabilities. All of the things in pink are new capabilities in uh, Microsoft Graph for Build 2018. I, I'll call out a couple of things. The first one is uh, you saw it a lot in the keynote this morning. The activity APIs supporting AAD and MSA accounts are now in GA, so it means that your applications can write activities that fit directly into the Windows timeline, whether that's across uh, you know, your app that is running on Windows or in iOS or in Android. You can make a call to the activities APIs and populate the Windows timeline with those activities. In preview, we have a new APIs for bookings, which is a service for small, medium businesses that allow you to interact with uh, small medium management, booking of uh, appointments and things like that for small, uh, small businesses. We also have a refresher of the Teams APIs. Uh, for those of you who know, back in around six months ago, we released a preview of the Teams APIs in Microsoft Graph. The first version of those APIs only allowed you to post messages into channels. Well, this refresh allows you to read messages, and so you can build in a whole uh, parallel um, conversation around all of the things that are in Microsoft Teams, both reading and writing chat messages. There's a lot of features coming out from Outlook as well. So this one in particular, if you're building experiences that support a global work workforce, so we have working hours, uh, time zones, and languages that support those capabilities across Outlook. OK, so that's for data sets. Now let's uh, take a look at capabilities. The Microsoft Graph offers several capabilities for developers. I'm going to start with webhooks. Webhooks, uh, you know, I think everyone knows what a webhook is. You create a subscription. You get a notification when the something changes based on that subscription. We have now uh, GA, uh, which is general availability, availability in production for webhooks of users and groups. This is a feature that has been asked for a long time, and we may have uh, landed for Build 2018. Then we have uh, Delta Query capability for, uh, again, Azure AD users and groups coming in, scoping filters. So for example, if I just want to get changes for a specific group, I can go and um, get a Delta token for that specific group changes. We are, have increased, so Microsoft Graph supports batching. We initially had a five, uh, five queries on the batch. Now we have increased that to 20. And then we have new capabilities on preview as well, like for example, the Java SDK, the managed access that I mentioned earlier, open API, and I'm, I'm gonna demo that later on for those of you who are familiar with Swagger. So Swagger is the evolution of, uh, OpenAPI is the evolution of Swagger, and we have now available descriptions for uh, OpenAPI in the Microsoft Graph. And uh, I think that's, gonna, that's about what I'm going to call in about capabilities. So tons of stuff landing in for build. If you want to um, get a refresher of all of the capabilities that we're launching, definitely check out our blog. There's a ton of videos. We put, like, we work together like 24 different videos across all of the different teams that participate in Microsoft Graph, going in detail about each of the uh, capabilities and functionalities that we've had released. So there, check out the, the videos. They're short, five, eight-minute videos. And then our change log. OK. Now let's go to getting started. How many of you have seen the Graph Explorer or the, the, the developer site for Microsoft Graph? OK, so probably we're not going to spend much time here. But I want to take the opportunity to, let me just sign in. OK.
I want to take the opportunity to show some of the work that we've done here in terms of developer experiences and how do you get started developing with the Microsoft Graph. The first thing and the only thing that you have to remember, it's graph.microsoft.com. So you put that in your browser, graph.microsoft.com, and that's going to redirect you to our developer portal. If you are now calling the API and passing in an access token and then calling one of the APIs underneath the graph, then you'll be able to get data. But if you just put it on the browser, it takes you to our developer portal. Uh, here in our developer portal, you'll be able to find any information about what is the Microsoft Graph, the set of numbers and, uh, that I've talked about, about the opportunity. What are the things that you can do with the Microsoft Graph? Now, we have a set of examples here for, uh, for the different set of services. For example, onboarding users, integrating with Excel, managing employee profiles, converting documents, and so forth. If you want to take a deeper look at these examples, we have them all here. For example, let me just go to this document conversion. This is one of the capabilities offered by SharePoint and OneDrive, where you can have, with a simple REST API call, get, do a file conversion from a, around, you know, I think it's over 200 file formats that are supported, to 10 different targets on, on the, where you're converting to. So here are some examples about what you can do with the Microsoft Graph. We have some partners as well. And then I'm going to you know, show you the Graph Explorer. For those of you who have not seen the Graph Explorer, this is a tool that we've built that allows you to quickly interact with the API. We have a lot of samples. Part of the Graph Explorer are pointers to the documentation. I can start interacting with the Graph Explorer without even having to be logged in. So for example, right now, I'm using a demo account. My alter ego, Megan Bowen, who's an auditor at Contoso, I guess. And we can get, start getting information uh, about what is the set of data, the data sets that are available in the Microsoft Graph. Here, by clicking on Show More Samples, we can see all of the different set of categories of data that we can bring in. So I can click on Users or OneDrive and, uh, say, People. And then all of those APIs are now going to show he right here for me to interact with. So I can quickly get on getting my direct reports. It's going to execute the request. It's going to show me the response right here. Now, not only the Graph Explorer supports that you get, that you read information from the Microsoft Graph. You can also read and write and do all of the operations for, obviously, for doing any, any write operations. You'll need to be signed in with your account. And then at that moment, you will be able to get, do requests like post and things like that. So another thing that you can find here on our developer portal are quick starts. I assume that most of you are um, .NET developers that like to leave in C Sharp. Uh, but th there we also have a lot of other platforms supported as part of the Microsoft Graph. So whether you're building an app on Angular or on Android or an iOS app, if you're building, building a UWP or if you're building an ISP.NET MDC application, you can start here and get an app running in less than two minutes. Like It will go through the process of doing the app registration, getting in that registration into the code, and then giving you a zip file that you can just download, pack and package, and run in a very simple flow. Then you can pick up your platform and then just go through it. And then lastly, I want to show the documentation. So we've done a lot of work for Bill to update the documentation for Microsoft Graph and tell you what are the opportunities and what you can do as a developer to build up with the API. So you'll find three sections in our documentation. You'll find a section to explore what is the, the Microsoft Graph, to learn about the different set of services, and then to develop. On the learn section, for each of the, se for each of the resources that are available in Microsoft Graph, you'll find out what they are, and what is the opportunity for you as a developer to integrate with them. So for example, if I go to the calendar, you'll see you know, why integrating with calendar, and why are, what are the capabilities and functionalities that you will find out there. Once you uh, have reviewed this information, then we'll have information about how to get started, getting your auth tokens, using the API, the API reference for our two versions of the graph that we have right now. We have a V1 version, which is the production-supported version, and we have a beta version, which is like where we have a lot of the 
preview capabilities of the API that have not yet graduated to uh, production. OK, so that is our getting started. I'm going to go back to the deck. How are we doing so far? Good? OK, here's where we're going to pick it up. Uh, and the pace is going to go really, really fast. I warn you, I'm not, I don't have a pretty story to tie up all of the different things that I'm going to show you. I'm just going to splash the, the, hey, this is API, this is why it's good, and then we're going to do some demos. And um, here we go. OK. Oh, the, this is actually my demo, which is it. API highlights. So what we're going to do here is we talked about Microsoft Graph being the gateway to Windows, Office 365, Windows 10, and enterprise mobility and security. So what are we going to do is we're going to pick a set of APIs from these three services. I'm going to highlight them to you, why they're important, why they're cool, show it, and then we're going to show a demo afterwards, OK? Let's start with these are the APIs that we're going to highlight, user photo, thumbnails, sending mail with adaptive cards and actionable messages, teams, activities, and security. Let's start with the simplest of one. If you want to integrate with the Microsoft Graph, the simplest thing that you, want, that you can do is provide a personalized experience to the user using the profile information. It's like no more, like I was saying this morning, no more filling out a different username and password. Who likes to do that? It's like, please don't give me a different uh, form to fill out a different username and password or a profile information. You can just call into the graph and get all of this information and calling to get a picture it's as simple as calling slash photo slash value. And that way, you can leverage the Microsoft identity and provide a personalized experience in your application. Now, that was the simple one. Now we go to another one, which is pretty cool. It's just the, all of the OneDrive APIs. So OneDrive has a lot of functionality into the Microsoft Graph, things like enumerating and searching uh, files that are in user, the user's drive, uploading and downloading large images, managing permissions, inserting um, photos, doing, working with data loss prevention, file conversion, as I showed uh, before, and thumbnails. Now, one of the things that I want to clarify about OneDrive is that when I say OneDrive, it's not just a consumer service. We have OneDrive as part of the commercial services as well. Uh, used to be like the SharePoint My Site. It's now the, the OneDrive for business. And then we also have OneDrive for every single group and every single site in SharePoint. So you can use the OneDrive APIs not only for the user's OneDrive, but you can also use it for any document library in SharePoint and get information of, and interact with the files. The one that I'm going to highlight here, and there's a session to learn more about the OneDrive APIs. The one that I'm going to highlight here is thumbnails. So thumbnails is actually a cool capability that takes advantage of a lot of processing on the SharePoint services that you can use a simple call to the Microsoft Graph to get pointers to a small, medium, and large URLs that are going to take you to a rendering of a thumbnail of a file. Now, these files, like there's over, it's actually 300 file formats that are supported by, by SharePoint. So if you have a CAD file stored in SharePoint, you can call the thumbnails API and get a rendering of that CAD file right, in your application, right? Like, so you don't have to write that logic. You can bring any of the files that are stored in SharePoint and bring in the, the visuals in your application. OK, next one, the Outlook APIs in the Microsoft Graph. So Outlook has messages, calendar, and tasks in the Microsoft Graph. For, for the mailbox, you know, everything, all the capability, not only reading and sending messages across your mailbox, but man your mailbox as well doing full text search on emails, defining rules, um, defining, like, for example, out of office messages, right? Like, so you can build workflows that go and say, like, if this user is out of office, then redirect this process to this other, to the manager, or something like that. In terms of calendar, we have APIs that allow you to interact with a full calendar, calendar invites, um, accepting invitations to a calendar. We have a pretty cool API that is called the Find Meeting Times API that you pass in a set of users, and they will tell you when is the best time for those users to meet. If you saw that, that yesterday on the Cortana demo that we did on the, at Satya's keynote, it was actually using the Microsoft Graph 
find meetings API to find out when is the best time for users on a given a given uh, set of users and a timeline. And the API that I'm going to highlight, oh, okay, there's a theater session. This is going to happen every time. There's going to deep, deeper dive on, on this session coming up, uh, I think it's today or this afternoon. Okay, and the API that I'm going to highlight for Outlook is sending actionable messages. So using the Microsoft Graph, you can send an actionable message in Outlook. Actionable messages are built using adaptive cards. So if you've heard about adaptive cards throughout the, the, the conference, adaptive cards are supported up across different renderers, and one of them is Outlook. You can send an adaptive card that has an action, and users can take action right within their inbox. How do you send it? Is within the message payload, the content type needs to be HTML, and the content is a script tag that has the payload for the card in the head uh, of the HTML. So the way that they were gonna, the, they're going to display is uh, like, like this. They render in across many different channels, or, and then it's a very simple JSON schema to build them. There's a, more, there's a session about a break, uh, breakout session about adapt, adaptive cards coming out yes, tomorrow. OK. So we're going to see this demo all together. We talked about profile picture. We talked about thumbnails. We talked about adaptive cards. In this demo, we're going to first, it's, in, the scenario is we're selecting a document in OneDrive to get an approval. So we're going to go and read all of the documents that are in OneDrive. We're going to then uh, select one of these documents, get a thumbnail for that document. Then we're going to, uh, we want the team to approve this document because it's ready to go, so it's like a bit. We're going to build a card. We're going to build one of these adaptive, um, actionable, uh, adaptive cards. And then we are going to send that message. So the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to build that message with the file information and the user's information. And then we're going to send that message, and we're going to see it in OWA with the adaptive card. Let's go to the demo. Oh, before we get there. I'm going to introduce Abdullah, who is one of the engineers on the Microsoft Graph team, and he's going to help us go through some of those demos today. Let's okay, jump to you the guys can hear me? machine. Okay, perfect. All can right, you guys so, see okay? Okay. All right, so what we're looking at is a Microsoft Bot Framework, so as Ina mentioned earlier. So let's start, the, let's start chatting with the board and see what happens. Can you guys see? Okay. All right, so I'm going to start the approval process. Now, what this is doing is using the Microsoft Graph.NET client library, and we're calling to the drive endpoint to the root, getting all of the children, or that means all of the items that are in one, that OneDrive. All right, so we got all the items, and let's pick a file to start the approval process. For example, I want uh, approval for this presentation. So the next call that we're going to do is we're going to get actually the details for that particular file. We're going to extend that to not only get the details, but also get the thumbnail. All right, let's see how the thumbnail renders. All right, so you got the file and the details in the thumbnail. So if I'm sure that this is the file, so let's say. So it's going to show me all the potential approvers. Now this is using the people's API. So for the sake of demo, I'm going to send email to myself. In this case, I'm Lydia and Diego. So let's send the request. So and now what we're going to do is we're going to build that JSON that is the, the card. And then we're going to package that up, put it in the script tag, and send it on the, on, on the message. So here we have the JSON that we've constructed for that adaptive card. And this is the, the a card that we're going to see on uh, the Outlook message. So let's go to the mail and uh, see if we got the email. Let's give it a minute. And there it is. And this is the adaptive card we just talked about. So if I want to, for example, approve this file, I can just say approved right from my email. And it's approved. Now let's go back to the board and see what's the end experience. And for this particular demo, we're actually using Cosmos DB to store the data of approvals. So we're using the bot framework, Cosmos DB, adaptive cards, Microsoft Graph, using thumbnails, 
Outlook integration. It's a lot of things here in this particular demo that are showing how you can bring all of this these technologies together to build apps. Um, in this particular case, building this workflow. So you can see the status in the bot framework that Lydia actually approved. Great. Thank you, Ayua. Abdullah. Okay. Now let's go to the get next set of API highlights. Let me see. I lost my machine. Five was this one. There you go. The next set is Teams. So I talked a little bit about Teams already. Teams have a set of APIs that allow you to manage collaboration in Microsoft 365. Now, one important clarification that I want to do about Teams is that Teams is built up on top of Office 365 groups. So if you're familiar with Office 365 groups, groups have one membership on Azure Active Directory. They have uh, files in SharePoint. They have conversations in Outlook or Microsoft Teams. And they have a lot of other collaboration capabilities, like, for example, tasks and thing like, things like that, that you're able to take advantage of during, in your applications. So for Teams in particular, we have APIs that allow you to create a team on top of an Office 365 group. That uh, configuration of the team allows you to like, add an update or delete that configuration. It also allows you to update a set of settings that are used by the Teams client uh, to use for this particular team. And it allows you to interact with the channels and the channel messages. With that, like if you're in a corporation that needs to autom automate the, the deployment or the life cycle of the teams, you can easily like, build up logic and scripts that like, automate the team life cycle, creating the team, adding members, configuring the settings, adding the channels, and so forth. So we're going to go and see a demo of how we do this in an application. Step six. Oh, but let, me, let me first talk to you about what we're going to see. So we're going to create a team. And creating a team is a request to the group's endpoint, because all of the teams are groups. And then we're going to create the channels. And we are going to add the members and the owners to this particular team. All OK. Right. So six. Six. So for this particular demo, what we're doing is imagine there's an airline. And we have all of the different flights in the airline. And we want to create a team for each of these flights. And the, each flight has a flight crew, so we're going to add all of the different set of uh, folks that are part of the crew into that particular team and start that collaboration in there. So we're going to go and create a team. All right. The code for that integration is pretty simple. In this case, we're not using the client library. In this case, we're using just REST requests against the service. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a group. And after we've created the group, we're going to add a team to it. So now it's creating group. And we're good. So um, let's uh, look at it in real time. I have a Teams client open uh, in a split window. So we'll see uh, the team getting created in real time. So let's create the team. And this team is created fly 142 in this case. Uh, now let's add some members to that team, in this case, the crew. So members are added. Now let's create another channel uh, real time for pilots to talk to each other. And it popped up in real time. Now let's go ahead and post a message to that channel. And there it is. And you can create smarter teams, too, which means that we have out-of-the-box integration with bot framework. For example, in this case, you're seeing SurveyMonkey, so you can create polls. And they seamlessly integrate with Microsoft Teams. Great. That's so it. what we saw is creating a team and interacting with the team right away, being able to create channels, being able to add post messages. And then we can also read messages from that uh, team. Next one. Uh, this is Windows in the graph. So now we're going to talk about Project Roam and the set of opportunities that Project Roam brings into Microsoft Graph. The first one is around activities. So the Activity API lets you read and write from your app activities from your app into the Windows timeline. It also lets the users pick up where they left off, because each of the activities has three core components. 
It has the vi how you're gonna visualize it on the timeline, what is it the, the um, description that you're gonna use, and what is the URL where you're gonna open up after when the user goes back to the timeline and clicks on it. So we have the activities API. This API has, is now GA, meaning that it's ready for production use, both for uh, organizational accounts and for consumer accounts. And then we also have the devices APIs. With the devices APIs, you can uh, discover and connect with other devices. You can send, remotely launch applications on those devices, and you can send commands to them. So let's gonna, we're going to see the, oh, and there's the Project Roam breakout session. And let's see one example of the activities APIs. He, this is the, how the payload looks like. We're basically making a put request to the me slash activities endpoint, put, setting on a unique ID for your application. Let's see the activities API in the Windows timeline. Not yet, I think I have to log in again. Okay. So here I'm gonna go back to back Graph Explorer. And if you go to the samples, you will see that there's a user activity sample on the Graph Explorer. If I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this user activities sample right here to create an activity on the Windows timeline. You know that it's very simple, rest and rest request to the, to the Microsoft Graph, and we're gonna be able to set up here, this is our activity ID, you guys can see correctly. And this is the activation URL. So here, this one is pointing to developer.com, the Microsoft.com slash Graph Explorer. Let's send it to Bing. And let's make that request. Now, that is going to get into the activity feed service. And now I can go to the Windows timeline and search for it. Graph Explorer, it says here, with activities, developers have a way to capture. When I open it up, it's gonna open up in Bing. Now, very simple, very easy to add your activities into the timeline and then let users pick up where they left off. Okay, let's go back to. Okay. The final one that I want to show around the, uh, the APIs is the security API. So these are, this is a preview that we just released a couple of weeks ago uh, around being able to get alerts uh, from the different security services that are at Microsoft and also from partners that participate in the, into the EQ system. The first set of APIs that are uh, part of this, uh, the security API set is alerts. And then we have a, a set of APIs that are coming soon around security profiles, actions, and configuration. The breakout session for the security team is actually going on at the same time, so you'll have to catch up the recording afterwards. We've done with the API highlights. I think we're actually gonna be able to go through all of the tips and tricks. Uh, I wanna do three more highlights, which is not specifically to APIs, but the first one is, we talked about this morning, there's new UWP controls for Microsoft Graph. So if you, how many of you are using the Windows Community Toolkit? Okay, so if you go to aka.ms Windows Toolkit, you'll be sent to the, I think it's the GitHub repo where we have the latest pull request. And we're gonna show a demo right now of the new UWP controls that we've added to the Windows Community Toolkit in order to easily integrate with the Microsoft Graph. All right, so what we're looking at is a Windows app, so um, a universal Windows platform. This is the app that you can get from the store. So if you, if you go to the Microsoft Store and search for uh, Windows Community Toolkit, it was previously named UWP Community Toolkit, you will be able to get this app. The current one that is in the store doesn't have these controls yet, but if you get, the, the, if you get it from, from, build it up from GitHub, then you will be able to get the controls. Yep, and it is integrated with Microsoft Graph out of the box. For example, we have this controls profile card and you just need to provide it a graph access token and user ID. So if you already have an app, so you are already doing the authentication management, uh, so you just need to pass uh, that authentication token to this. So let's say uh, if I have this user ID, so I can get the picture, I can get other controls, for example, this large profile with this, so you can render this in your Windows application. Let's look at the XAML. So you just copy this. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Yep. 
let's see if you can see it now. All right, so this is your XML. You just copy it, and out of the box, it, it automatically integrates with Microsoft Craft. Let's so as, as we were saying this morning, it's just a few lines of SAML that you can bring in those controls into your application, and you're able to reuse all of this functionality, like uh, the, the profile control. We have also a people picker, which we're going to show right now. Yeah, let's try the people picker. So for example, if I want to, let's pick this person, Grady, maybe pick one more. Let's try the XAML. So you just put this in your application, and out of the box, you're integrated with Microsoft Craft. And we have this uh, services, too. So you can connect with different services. For example, in this case, you can connect with Microsoft Craft. You just need to provide your client ID, and you can connect out of the box if you're a Windows developer. And as I mentioned this morning, actually, there was a lot of MVPs that collaborated and contributed to the code that we have here. This is open source. If you want to contribute as well, you're welcome. And I want to thank again all of the MVPs that contributed to make this possible. OK, the next highlight, we did that, is uh, OpenAPI v3. So how many of you know about Swagger? OK, this is one of the things that we got asked a lot when we released the Microsoft Graph, is when are you going to bring out Swagger descriptions? Well, Swagger is no longer, uh, because those of you who know, Swagger is actually a proprietary thing from SmartBear, and they open source it. It was renamed to OpenAPI. OpenAPI v3 was released last November, and was the first time that it allows us to describe a graph API with this type of descriptions. The descriptions that we have available in GitHub right now uh, are describing the first level of the graph, meaning the first level of resources and the first level of relationships. It's not quite complete yet, but it's enough for interoperability scenarios. So we can go and, and get all of the description format for a Microsoft Graph on uh, OpenAPI v3. So let's see that. Let's bring it here. So one of the cool things, this is just a Swagger UI, and we have the beta description of the API. I'm not going to click on it because it does lazy load, so it's going to take a little bit uh, to just load each of the resources. But it just in terms of interoperability, like the, the doors that connecting or providing Swagger descriptions or OpenAPI descriptions for the Microsoft Graph opens up is a lot. So right now, we have them available in GitHub. And towards the summer, we're going to make them available in the API endpoint, as we do for our EDM description. So today, if you go to, I'm going to go back to the Graph Explorer. And I'm just going to click here. Where's my mouse? dollar metadata. This is the, oh, of course it's not a put, it's a get. This is the API description for Microsoft Graph. This is the EDMX. And uh, similar to this, we're going to put in the, this, this, the open API descriptions for the Microsoft Graph. Okay, let's go back to the slides. <clears throat> okay, and the last highlight is um, how many of you consider yourselves also citizen developers, where you don't want to write a whole bunch of code, uh, but you, for example, want to start with um, a Flow or a Power App or Logic Apps. Well, we've also been working at, uh, with the Power Apps and Logic Apps and Flow team to connect to Microsoft Graph. So we've created a whole bunch of Microsoft Graph connectors that you will be able to reuse if you're building whether it is flow integrations, or logic apps, or power apps. Let's see one of those thing, uh, things in action. What we did is we partnered with the power apps team, and we built a set of templates that connect directly with the Microsoft Graph. And we're going to show one of them. The temp there are about 10 different templates, ranging from sending kudos to your organization, prepping meetings, finding rooms for meetings, and so forth. We're going to take a look at meeting capture, which is actually like aim to help you in the process of organizing your meeting, bringing up, uh, capturing all of the notes that you want uh, in that particular meeting, capturing uh, um, tasks that you can then put into Planner, and so forth. So here we have the Power Apps authoring experience, because this is a template. You can customize it, and, you know, brand it to your organization, add more visuals to it, and so forth. 
We're just going to take this one as it is, and we're going to run it. And what you can see here is that it is immediately connecting to the Microsoft Graph for this particular user and bringing on all of the meetings that we have for this user. We're going to select one, and we're going to start the meeting. Now here, you will see that uh, this is for the note taker of the, of the meeting. It's going to come out and take all of the notes. It shows up all of the attendees that are part of the meeting. It shows up the details. We can create new tasks in Planner. and assigned to uh, folks that are part of the, the meeting. And then once the meeting is completed, then it's going to allow us to, allow us to put all of this information in OneNote, which is part of the Microsoft Graph, in Planner, which is also part of the Microsoft Graph, and of course, send an email with this information. So this is one of the templates that we've built with the Power Apps team that already out of the box has built up experiences that you can start using to connect to data from the Microsoft Graph. OK. We actually, you know, it was faster than I thought. So we were able to go through some of this. So tips and tricks. Here is a set of seven tips and tricks in terms of working with a Microsoft Graph. Again, there is not a particular story putting this together, but I just want to go through them in terms of, like, if you're a developer that is starting, how do you go about integrating with the Microsoft Graph in your applications? How do you? Uh, take advantage of the capabilities that are in the graph. So let's go. The first one is Graph Explorer is your best friend. So how many of you use things like uh, Postman or Fiddler or Charlie or things like that? Well, you can use the Graph Explorer to do a lot of these requests. And it also has prepackaged requests that you can interact and pointers to the documentation right away. I'm not going to go and demo this again because we already see saw it. But one of the things that I want to call out is that the Graph Explorer is open source. So if you uh, would like to contribute, if you'd like to see new functionality on the Graph Explorer, then you know, send us a pull request. Tip number two, know the seven basic operations in the Microsoft Graph. So Microsoft Graph is a REST endpoint. And by being a REST endpoint, it uses HTTP methods to uh, clarify the intent of the requests that you want, want to do. So of course, if you want to list a collection, you're going to do a get request to that particular endpoint. The example that I have here is getting users. It's going to return, me, return all of the members of that collection. If I want to get a member of a collection, then again, with a get request, I'm going to get uh, users and then that particular member identified by the ID. If I want to create a member, then I, want, I will use a post for example, in the user's collection, or a put in the activities collection. If I want to update, then patch, and then delete and invoke. Now, here is an important one. There are a set of uh, operations in the Microsoft Graph that you invoke with a post. Now, this is like, think like, for example, verifying a domain or sending an email. There are a set of actions that you will send. You will need to send additional information in the body in order to execute this particular this particular request. And finally, we have batch. Batch is also executed on a post. And um, batch is basically just sending multiple requests over the wire. So when you're using post, patch, or put, if you don't need to get a response, then you can opt out of the response. And how you opt out of the response is using the HTTP header prefer return equal minimal. Sometimes you do need to get data back. So for example, when you're creating a group, you want to get back the ID of the group so that you can, you can look afterwards operate with the group. But, but if you are doing operations that you don't necessarily need to get a payload back, then you can just uh, pass in this header and uh, skip the, the payload. Now in terms of batching, batching allows you to send multiple requests over the wire. And uh, they go over a post uh, operation. Um, method. And uh, one of the things that you can do with batching is that you can also, you can send all types of requests. You can get a, uh, get a patch. You cannot nest batches, uh, but you can um, create serialized batches by putting dependencies on it. And the response of that batch is basically you get an array that says each for each of the re requests, what was the result of the batch. 
Next tip, learn the seven basic parameters. And seven is kind of a theme here. The first one is, so Microsoft Graph is an API that is based on OData. And as such, you can use OData query parameters to operate on the data that you're going to get. So for example, you can use filter to get a set of filter results out of the data. So I only want to get users whose name starts with J, so I can start, I can use the dollar filter operation, and then the clause starts with to uh, filter down the result set that I'm getting from that particular request. Same, similar fashion, I can use select to just bring a projection of, that, of the properties of that resource. So for example, I can just say, just select the name, the surname, at the job title. I can order by the results. I can page as well. So for example, with top, I can say, just bring me the top five res uh, results. I can expand. So in the first demo where we were showing the getting the details of the, of the file and then expanding to the thumbnail, we can do that in a single request. We can count and search as well. Now here, I'll, I'll say two things. One about dollar select. So one, when you're making a request to the profile, and if you, you see a default payload back, that payload doesn't mean that the, in, in the V1 endpoint, it doesn't mean that that's all of the properties that we have for the user. It means that we've selected a set of properties to be the default payload, and you can select any one of the properties that you want through using the select parameter and just bring in the data that your application needs. So if you don't need the other properties, just don't ask for them. Yeah, and then I have the example there. And then for example, and then the next one in the filter is just choosing the records that your application needs. So here, if I just want to get all of the users filtered by the department and uh, selecting just those two properties. OK, tip number four, server-side pagination. So Microsoft Graph does server-side pagination. So if you, get, uh, if you can make a request to the graph to this particular collection and you only see a, re a, a result of 20, like if you call two users and you get 20 users back, it doesn't mean that 20 is the total number of users that you have in your organization. It means that that was the size of the page that Microsoft Graph returned to you. And then we use next links to give you the next page on your uh, request. So here's an example. You're, we're calling into the message resources. And then we what we get here is an OData next link that shows us the next page. Um, now, this, these uh, next links are completely opaque. You should not take any dependency of them. It's just like follow the link, and it will take you to the next pages until it uh, doesn't have any, anyone else. Next tip, whelp hooks and Delta Query. So um, for many, many cases in your application, you need to track changes. If you want to say, I want to know what, ha what happens, and I want to do processing of data based on uh, changes on the data on the, on, the, on, on, on the Microsoft Graph, then you can do two things. One is create a webhook. So say, for example, we want to watch uh, a particular document library in SharePoint, right? Like, so we're going to create a webhook that allows us to watch that document library. And then the second thing is we're going to create a delta token at that particular moment in time that was going to tell us the snapshot. Like, at this moment in time, this was the, the state of that document library. And then time passes, and then you're going to get, and then, uh, when there is a change in that document library, you're going to get, your application is going to get notified because we created that webhook. And you can go call with that Delta token back to just get the information that was changed on that particular document library. So why, why is it useful? Because the alternative to doing that is that your application pulls for changes, right? So like, instead of getting a webhook and pairing that with Delta, you're just going to start calling the graph to see what are the, all of the changes that are happening on a particular resource. And sometimes you know, polling is not optimal. And also, you don't know how, what is the interval to pull um, Go back to the service. OK, so this is how you get uh, Delta tokens with change tokens with Delta. What you're going to get is when you create, when you call the Delta function, then you're going to get paging of the resource with the next link. And then at the end, you're going to get a Delta link. That's the one that you want to store. And that's the one that you want to use at the end, uh, you know, subsequently to call and get the changes. 
I already explained, this is how the typical pattern of calling and then waiting for the webhook. Yes, question. Can you please go to the microphone? That webhook call, um, you have to go query to find out what's the latest. So if there were two changes on that, on that resource in that time, you only get the latest change? No, you get... Or will you get a change set for both of them? Yes, exactly. So if you, so the question was, if you get a, a change notification, so you get a notification on your, on your application that something has changed, and then there were two changes that happened simultaneously or within that time frame, when you call back using that Delta token, you will get back all of the changes that happened since the last time that you snapshot at the Delta token. So if there are one, or many changes, you're gonna get those changes is within that time window. Okay, next tip, adding your data to the graph. There's two ways into which you can add your data to the graph. The first one is around open extensions, and the second one is around schematized extension. Open extensions are a very, very basic key value pair. So for example, favorite color blue, like if you wanna provide roaming capabilities in your application and you wanna keep simple user settings like that, you can uh, create an open extension and then add that information into resources that we already have in the graph. These are non-searchable and these are per um, resource. And then you have schema extensions as well. So let's take a look at um, Open extensions. So open extensions, there is a couple of good practices. We use reverse DNS, DNS naming for uh, identifying the extensions. And like I mentioned, it's a flexible key, key value pair for adding additional data into resources in the graph. Here's an example of uh, adding, a calling and a resource that already has an extension. So we have the ID, the theme, the color, and the language as key value pairs that are coming in, extending the user uh, in the graph. Now, schema extensions. Schema extensions actually allow you to define a schema. So as a developer, you're gonna say, I am going to extend, let's say for example, a group. I'm gonna extend each of the groups that uh, have this particular schema, and I'm gonna add a set of properties, schematized properties that you can actually type, um, attach them to a specific type, and um, then add that, right, that data into the graph. They're discoverable across different applications, so if you define a schema, other applications will be able to uh, get access to that and, and uh, access that information as well. Here's an example of a schema extension. And all of these samples, by the way, are available in the Graph Explorer, so if you wanna go back and interact with this information, you can absolutely do that. The important thing to note here is that we actually validate that if you define in the schema that course ID is an integer, then we actually are gonna validate that when, we're, when the requests are coming in to write into that schema. Okay, so let's see all of these in the Graph Explorer. You wanna go here? Sure. So we're gonna go to Graph Explorer. And we're gonna show some of these requests uh, real quick on how do we use the different methods, how do we use the query parameters, and how do we use some of that functionality. And like I said, all of these is available in the Graph Explorer just by like clicking around on things that you uh, wanna see. So the first one that we're gonna start with is, here's a profile, very simple request. And now we talked about, um, using query parameters, right? So I can come in here and say select, and then say about me. And this is the only property. Question oh, question mark, I'm missing a question mark right here. So this is the only property that I want about uh, this particular request. I'm not gonna bring the 100 plus properties that are part of the user, uh, pro the user profile. I'm just gonna bring in um, one. Another one is, for example, around, uh, we talked about search. So let's say I'm gonna bring in the samples from the people API, and uh, we're gonna search for all of the people that are related to this user that starts with the name, with the letter J. So it's a very simple way to express that query, param that query parameter with search and then pass in the information. 
And we also talked about extensions. Let me see, just show more examples here. And then we have the extensions right here. This is what we showed before. Let me just make it a little bit bigger. Into like calling in the Microsoft Graph, selecting a set of properties, and then expanding. Look that I'm using here the expand operation on the extensions that we've created for this particular user. OK, this one doesn't have any one yet, but we can create them using this post request. And then we're going to run this query. We're going to see that now we have created this extension. When we go back to get that request, we're going to see now the extensions being populated. Super simple. We're adding data to the graph. This data can be data from our line of business services. This data can be data that we're using in our applications to roam settings and so forth. Um, what else do we show? Delta. Well, actually, Delta, let's, let's skip that for the sake of time. And let's go back to the deck. Next tip using less pre least privileged permissions. So this is something that I've seen. And um, when developers start to integrate with the Microsoft Graph, the first thing that they need to understand and go through is auth. How do you get that access token? Because if you don't have an access token, you're basically going to get nothing from the graph. You need to get uh, the access token, which represents the authorization that the user has given to your application to access data on behalf of that user. Now, before we go and talk about these uh, least privileged permissions, we need to review some of this information around getting that access token. The first one is permissions to the Microsoft Graph. There is a lot of data behind Microsoft Graph, and each of these uh, data sets are behind a specific permission. The permissions are scoped like this. There is a resource, an action, and a scope. The resource is the target entity. For example, files, users, directory, groups, activities, so forth, right? Like that's the thing that you want to access. The second, the action, is what you want to do with that uh, information. You want to read it. You want to read and write it. You want to create new. Some of them have a create. And the third one is the scope. If there's nothing. It means it's for the user. Files.read, it's for that particular user. If there is a dot all, then it means it's for the entire organization. Files.read.all, it's like you're going to read all of their files across all of the organization. And of course, some of them, you know, users will be able to consent. Others will require administrators to consent, because I don't have the rights to give access to others' inf users' information within my organization, right? OK, the next thing is we're going to talk about is the permissions types. If you want to build an application that is a user interactive application that access data on behalf of a user, then you're going to use delegated permission. It works for mobile apps, for web, for SPA, and you get access on behalf of users. Depending on what type of permission you're ask, accessing, then users will be able to consent, or administrators will need to consent on behalf of the organization. And the effective permissions of the request, and this is super important, is the intersection between the permissions that the user has and the permissions that have been granted to the application. I'm going to give you an example. Let's say I um, build an application that wants to access the user's files. Now, if I consent to that application, you know, the application will be able to call to the Microsoft Graph on behalf of myself to the uh, OneDrive endpoint and get all of that information. Now, if they, that application calls and gets ac trying to get access to a file that I don't have access, well, obviously, that call is going to get access denied, because the effective permissions of the request are the things that the user has access to and the application has access to. Now, the next one is around application permissions. There are times where you run your building services or daemon applications that don't have a user present. This is not a non-interactive flow, right? Like you are building a, a service daemon, an Azure function that runs trigger on a, on a timer job or runs every night at midnight and does some batch cleaning or things like that. And you're accessing the service 
you're accessing as a, a service. Here, there is no other choice. Administrators need to consent because the application is acting not, uh, not acting on behalf of a user, it's acting on its own identity. And the permissions, the effective permissions, are the ones that are granted to the application. So for example, if the application gets access to read all the mail, all the mailboxes across the organization, this application will be able to read all of those mailboxes and that requires an administrator to consent to it. And as such, it can then do the processing of the data that it requires um, acting on these permissions. Now the next thing is after we have the permission, so we know what type of data we're gonna access, right? The next thing is actually getting access to that data. We know that we're going to say, for example, read user's mailbox. So it's mail.read the permission that we're going to get, uh, get access to. So we're gonna send the user to a standard OAuth 2.0 flow to get an access token. This is no different from any other API that uses OAuth 2.0 in the industry. So it is a flow where you're gonna send the user through consent, that delegation is gonna be stored in the authorization server, you're gonna get an access token, and this is a token that you use to call the Microsoft Graph. So the first thing that you're gonna do is getting an authorization. This is a simple request to the uh, auth endpoint. Here I'm using the, uh, the V2 endpoint for our authorization, and passing in the scopes that my application will access. In this case, I'm passing in one, the, the first one is the OpenID Connect scope that allows me to use single sign-on with this particular user. The second one is offline access, will, which will allow me to get a refresh token to then come back afterwards to the authorization server and get an access token. And the third, last two are uh, access to specific resources in the graph. So user.read, which is gonna allow me to use, read the user profile for that user and then files.read.write, which is gonna allow me to read and write information in through the user's files. The user is gonna see a consent UI that is gonna specifically express what are the things that uh, that application was asking for. And then, after the user consent, I'm gonna be able to go to the token endpoint to get, access, to get an access token. And with that access token, I can make a call to the graph. The access token is valid for an hour, if I requested a refresh token, I will be able to go back to the authorization server and get back a new access token. So now we can go to the tips around using least privileged permissions. The first one is, of course, don't ask for everything. Just ask for the things that your application needs. Sometimes I've seen apps where they go and click all of the different options in the app registration portal. That's a no-go for a production app, right? Like, you wanna make sure that your application is not a vector for security vulnerability for your, cu your customers and your users. So ask for the minimal set of permissions that your application needs and no more. The second one is uh, around administrators. So we, you're, sometimes your app will require a different set of permissions, right, when you are building your application. So we have the capability of sending users through a flow that allows users to consent. So for example, if you just want, hey, I just want access to your calendar. So you can send a user through that, inform, through that calendar uh, flow. And then we have keep resources and that require administrator consent. So instead of bundling them together, which is gonna block the adoption of your app. So say for example, my app needed calendar.read and directory access. Directory access is directory.read is one that needs administrator permissions because you're getting access to the entire directory in your organization. If I put them together, then it's gonna block the first step of my application adoption for users, right? Like because end users are not gonna be able to uh, consent. If I separate them using a thing that we called about dynamic consent, so the, uh, the users can come in, provide access to the calendar, start using my application, and then when my application needs directory access, I can send the administrator to that different flow. So don't bundle them up together, be cognizant about which ones require user, which ones require administrator. And then finally, when you're building a multi-tenant application, so if you are an ISV that are building an application for multiple customers, that same application, your different customers might have different set of uh, states of, being, of having consented your application. So say for example, your application on time zero requests user.read, and on time zero plus one, it requires calendar.read. So you're gonna have a combination of where those um, 
delegations are. So be mindful in your code to say like, hey, if I got a 403, does my app have the right permissions? And then send the user again through a consent flow. And then finally, app only. App only is for only for non-interactive scenarios. So I've seen this also where developers say, I'm just going to get app only. It gets me access to all of the data. And then when my user comes in, I'm just going to show them what, what uh, I uh, like in their application. It's like, no. App only is, is getting access to all of the data in the organization. And by doing so, you will be bypassing the permissions that we have in Office 365. So b make sure that if you're using app only, it's for the right reasons. OK. That actually wraps up all the tips. I thought we were not going to be able to go through all of them. So it's like I either speed up like crazy, or we actually had 75 minutes of content. <laughs> We're going to show a final demo. And this demo is going to use Azure Functions, Cognitive Services. We're going to be doing transcription of some audio files. It's going to use the OneDrive endpoint to get, um, get those files in it. And it's going to use webhooks and Delta. So let's see it. All right. So it's already running. It's a live demo like the others. So everything should work. OK, so I'm already signed in. So uh, as Ina mentioned earlier, so uh, we're going to start watching a document library, a folder. And we're going to process those files in that uh, library in the background using Azure Functions. So this is a simple OneDrive uh, JavaScript picker, file picker. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I'm interested in watching this audio file. And you can process all kinds of files, Excel, any kind of data processing, post-processing. In this case, we're doing audio files. So let's start watching it. So now, in the back end, it's creating a webhook subscription using Microsoft Graph. And it's done. So now we're watching that folder. So we use the OneDrive file picker, which is a JavaScript SDK that you can uh, invoke from your code. It's going to show up that UI. You don't have to build it yourself. It's going to allow you to select files or folders in OneDrive. We selected a folder, and then we created a webhook subscription on that particular folder. So let's go ahead and upload something and see what happens in that folder. So I have a couple of audio files here. Let's upload this one. So, so that, now that we're up, up, uploading this file, that's going to trigger our notification. That notification is going to be received by our Azure function. And then the Azure function is going to process that notification. It's going to go back to OneDrive, read that file, and then send the contents of that file to Cognitive Services to the transcription endpoint. Then we're going to get the transcription of the file and write that information back into SharePoint or OneDrive. So let's write that information back and see what happens. So the call was a success. Let's refresh this page. And you see this transcription popped up. And if so, this we ha just have one file in this case. Let's say you have hundreds of files. You don't want to process all of them. That's where Delta Delta Query comes in. So it will only give you the files that were uploaded after a certain time. So 101th file will be processed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's, let's go back to the. Okay. Oh, I missed telling you what was going to happen on the demo. Well. Next it. steps. So Microsoft Graph Beyond Build 2018, there's a lot of investment that we have across Microsoft on Microsoft Graph. Uh, if you haven't heard enough about it during you know, yesterday and today and all of the momentum that we have, we're bringing together all of these different services to make it very easy for you to integrate with them, to put them in your applications, to access all of this data, and uh, we keep adding more and more data sets. Richer query capabilities. We're improving also the consent experience to allow more granular set of permissions and more control to the users. We are going to be introducing a set of validation policies for the apps that are built. So you'll have to like validate your domain, validate your application, and all that in order to make sure that we're all users are always in control of how they share the data with the applications. And then, of course, you can influence the way we execute. So you can influence our roadmap by sharing your feedback and your feature requests through user voice. We keep an eye on this. We look at what are the things people are asking for. And uh, share your suggestions in user voice and send us your feedback. 
There's a ton of Microsoft Graph sessions this week. Take a picture of this slide. This is our breakout sessions that we have in, across uh, the different set of services that are available, this window, security, um, mixed reality. One of the things that um, we have here, where the, the session for the Project Rome falls, oh, there. Tomorrow, uh, today at 3. So today at 3, right after this session. So yeah, so don't miss that, because you're going to see all of the ways into you, you can drive user engagement through the activities APIs and the device APIs. We also have a lot of theater sessions for those of you who like to camp at the expo area. There's a lot of things that we'll be talking about Microsoft Graph, in particular Microsoft Graph with other set of services. We've shown a lot uh, in our demos today, building Microsoft Graph experiences with cognitive services, with Azure functions. We're going to have some things with IoT. We're going to have things with uh, more adaptive cards and smart UI. So Power Apps was actually yesterday. So make sure to tune in for these sessions in the theater as well. And then we have a set of workshops uh, that are available. These are things where you can go hands on and go directly and play with code. There's a you know, few of them that I have already passed, but there's a couple more that you can tune in today and tomorrow. And then, I, as I mentioned earlier, we have a ton of Channel 9 videos, so look for the videos in Microsoft Graph. And then we are active in Twitter, hashtag Microsoft Graph. Send us, let us know about the applications that you're building. Our GitHub repo is slash um, github.com slash Microsoft Graph. We have all of our samples there across many different languages. We have the open API descriptions that I mentioned today. We have a ton of, ton of content that is available for you. And finally, of course, if you're a developer and you're interacting with our APIs and you run into any issues or you have questions, we're very active on Stack Overflow. Tag us with Microsoft Graph, and you'll get uh, one of our engineers going helping you with, your, your, with a problem or your issue. Visit in the booth, visit thedeveloperoffice.com, join the developer program. Oh, actually, this is pretty cool. If you have not done this, you have to go right now to dev.office.com and sign up to the developer program. By doing so, you're going to get an Office 365 tenant that you can use in your development. And uh, you, you know, it basically has all of the information there so you can start playing right away with the APIs and all of the data from Microsoft Graph. And then we also have a monthly community call. So every, the first Tuesday of each week, uh, join us on that community call. We come and we share what's new, what's coming. And um, you know, it happens every month. And with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you for spending the time today.